As representing the discipline of history to some extent on this panel, and I will say something about the past, but I'll also be saying something about the present and the future, but I feel like to do justice to my discipline, I should um, obey one of its rituals, which is we often like to start our presentations with a joke. And this is one of the first talks I've given since Obama's been um, president, and it's one of the first talks I've given since we've been marking the 30th anniversary of the reform period associated with Deng Xiaoping. So what better than a joke that brings together Obama and Deng Xiaoping? And it's also the first joke that I ever had text messaged to me on a cell phone in China. Um, it was sent to me in Chinese. And it goes basically like this. And to understand it, you need to know that one of Deng Xiaoping's fa most famous sayings was to show his pragmatism. It doesn't matter if a cat is a white cat or a black cat. If it catches mice, it's a good cat. So the joke went something like this. Americans had always voted for white presidents, never black presidents. But then finally, they were influenced by Deng Xiaoping's thought. And they realized it doesn't matter if it's a black president or a white president. If it can solve a crisis, it's a good president. All right. Now, getting a only more serious, but only a little bit more serious, there's this slide up here, which um, I, I was trying to find an image related to the Olympics. We, the Olympics were saturated, we were saturated with images of the Beijing Games. So what's an image that you haven't seen? And I, I have a feeling most of you haven't seen this one, unless you happen to buy my last book, China's Brave New World, which uses it. But it's a shot of... Um, the lead up to the Olympics. I think it's important to think of the Olympics, and the keynote last night described that away. The, the Olympics, the 2008 Olympics didn't just take place in 2008. We need to think of them as something that began with the bids, that began with the lead up, that began with the promotion. And I'm going to argue they aren't over yet, but I'll get to that at the end. Um, but this was a Shanghai, um, something showing that Shanghai, too, was supporting of the Olympics. There's often tension between Beijing and Shanghai. Shanghai got a little bit, got some soccer matches, but they were also um, showing they were part of this. And I think this is a great slide to show any time I give a talk in Southern California, because it looks to me like a runaway float from It's a Small World more than anything else. So. That's one reason um, to show that uh, it's a new image. The other is I've got a book that I'm flogging, which is about um, Shanghai. So I wanted to show you an image about Shanghai. And I'll get back to why um, Shanghai in 2010 is something worth thinking about when thinking about Beijing in 2008. But um, first, I want to give you just a very quick overview. And Xu Shen's covered some of the things I might have covered. So this is, this is, these are basically the takeaway points. Um, in coming to terms with the Beijing Olympics as a historian, one of the things that I think is important to think about is the battle of historical analogies that took place before the games and during the games, and also the way we might think of other analogies um, as well. In many ways, the lead up to the games was a battle between two, in, in the international sphere, two analogies to past Olympics. You know, there was um, Mia Farrow and others trying to brand the games in a negative way as the Genocide Olympics or as a throwback to Berlin 1936, a mistake in giving a totalitarian regime the ability to host a great event. The counter to that, not so much from the Chinese side, but from the IOC side, was to throw up the example of Seoul in 1988 recognizing a country that was emerging perhaps from a period of authoritarian and closed rule to re-engaging with the world, and perhaps the Olympics would help push things along in this opening up direction, as it happened with South Korea democratizing around the time of the Seoul Olympics. Personally, I think both of those analogies were of limited, um, limited real utility, or at least didn't cover the waterfront of ways you could think about what Beijing in 2008 meant, and some other analogies that some people brought up in the public debate about it or public discourse, but I think could have had more, were the 1964 <coughs> analogy, which was the Tokyo Olympics, that were an effort by a country to say, start thinking about us as a modern country. Don't just think of us in relation to a dark period of our recent past. Tokyo's reintegration to a kind of global order after um, World War II. And in some senses, I think this was one of the efforts of um, Beijing with the 2008 games. Is forget about a period of distress and chaos, things like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Look at us anew. 
which was what Tokyo wanted in 64 and got, and Beijing wanted in 2008 to some extent got. Another analogy that would have been worth thinking about more was 68, the Mexico Olympics, where Mexico was saying, stop thinking of us as a poor, underdeveloped country, think of us in part as a modern country that's part of, uh, part of the modern world. And I think that was another thing that Beijing was after through the Olympics, and I think achieved more so, more successfully than putting behind the um, images of it as a repressive state. They did put behind it the, repress the images of it as a, as a poor country. 1904 and 1908 are other, um, other Olympic analogies I think are fun to play with, but um, the 1904 one is a brash country that was hosting the Olympics for the first time, and as Susan Brownell has written, a lot of the world thought they weren't ready for the games yet and sort of mocked them. Europeans said, you know, you're too backward to, re you're sure you make a lot of money, but I, do you really have the culture to carry on this great Olympic tradition? And that was what one critique of Beijing was. In 1904, it was the critique of the United States hosting the Olympics at the St. Louis um, World's Fair. 1908, I won't go into, but it was the London Olympics, the first London Olympics, and there was a boycott at the time in part called by Irish athletes who wanted to compete under their own um, a national team and Finnish athletes who didn't want to compete under the Russian flag. And I think, too, it's worth thinking about that with the debates about Tibet that came up with these Olympics. It's not the first time that issues of kind of imperial control or colonialism were seen as a problem at a time, a controversy during the Olympics. Um, Shushin's already made this point, though I would have made it a little differently in the, the, the um, attitudes around the world toward the Olympics. I think in the United States, we sometimes think of the international impact of the Olympics. We really, we think, what did Americans think about the Olympics? Well, there's a lot more to the international that China was trying to influence than American opinion. And for many parts of the world that China cares a great deal about, um, the Olympics were much more successful, much less of an ambiguous triumph um, than they were to the United States, France, and Japan, which were ambivalent about China hosting the games in the first place. To many parts of the world, there was um, just all that really lingered probably in many minds from the Olympics was how modern a show this country that had often been thought of as part of the developing world rather than the developed world had put on. Um, so I'm going to think, talk about rebranding and talk about how the games um, aren't over yet, how we need to think of a multi-part relay of spectacles in which 2008, August 2008, was, was in some ways a very high intensity, but still midway point in that, that the torch relay and other things preceded it need to be seen as part of the phenomenon. And the count, there are countdown clocks you know, that were counting down to Beijing 2008. There are still countdown clocks in China. It's just now they're counting down to May 1st, 2010, when China hosts its first World's Fair. And Olympics and World's Fairs are the two biggest mega event tra traditions out there. China's had one. It's about to, um, it's going to have another soon. Um, if you want to know more about things that I go over very quickly, this is um, a book that another speaker uh, who was supposed to be on later in the day but had to pull out um, for, um, for unexpected reasons was going to be plugging. It's, it's a book that comes out of a group blog that Susan Brownell, who will be speaking later, has been doing um, wonderful pieces on the Olympics uh, on the blog through, over time, and others of us have been doing. And this is a book devoted to 2008. Um, where we also found an image that wasn't overused. We thought that the boy, you, you can't quite see it very well there, but he has the um, 2008 uh, shaved into his head, showing the excitement of uh, the event. But it's a collection, an anthology of pieces about 2008 as a year in China's history from many different perspectives, many different disciplines, journalists, freelance writers, as well as academics, graduate students, and faculty. So um, be on the watch. It'll be out in March. So running through it, I've already run through these analogies. I'll just say that I really like the 1964 analogy, the Tokyo one, because I think it captures well what Beijing wanted to accomplish from the games, which was to have the world look at it anew and focus on how far it had come in the recent past 
And um, I think that was, that was the goal. The other thing that's wonderful about 1964, from my point of view, in this argument about a multi-stage relay, is that the Tokyo 1964 Olympics were followed by the 1970 Osaka World Expo, which was another part of this one-two punch to say, we're back and we're central. After that, they did a third thing, which is um, Japan got a third thing, which is a marker of um, kind of modernity and spectacle in the current period that succeeded. The World's Fair were the first great markers of modernity and spectacle. The Olympics were the second. The third, everybody in Southern California should know, is getting Disneyland. And so Tokyo got the 64 games, Osaka got the World Expo in 70, and then um, Tokyo Disney opened in the early 1980s. They're just signing a deal to bring a full-scale Chinese Disneyland to um, Shanghai soon after the 2010 World Expo. Yes, there is one in Hong Kong already, but it's a smaller scale one. All right, the opening, the opening ceremony as an exercise in rebranding is one way, I think, to think about it. The goals of it were to rebrand China as a modern, technologically sophisticated place, was one of the goals. Another was to rebrand China as an open place, to forget images of repression. And then finally, I would argue, uh, and this is probably the most unusual way, which I'll need some explanation, it was a way of rebranding China not as simply a red place in the sense of a revolutionary um, communist party run state, but as a place that was yellow and blue while still remaining red all over. And I'll explain that through these sets of images from the opening ceremony showing more closely. I don't think I need to say much about the success of the rebranding effort to show that China was capable of high-tech <laughs> spectacle. Everybody agreed that it showed this. And, and the fireworks and the Bird's Nest Stadium itself banished forever, I think, in many minds the idea that, the, that, that you could sum China up by images of um, a rickshaw puller or um, a lone farmer with an ox um, tilling fields in front of giant mountains. That's one image of China still, but now I think whenever anybody thinks of China in the outside world, there's another image, a kind of high-tech image. This was already going on before the Olympics with Shanghai skyscrapers and so forth, but this really crystallized that. So that kind of rebranding. Also in the opening ceremonies itself, you realize they skipped over everything from about the 17th century up until the moon shots or um, astronauts were shown. So there was an idea, forget our recent past, focus on our technological future. But more complicated than that was going on in, um, in the opening ceremony was a three-part color scheme that just very briefly in one strain in Chinese culture now, the color yellow, um, tends to stand for the Confucian past, the imperial past. The color blue tends to stand for China's connections to the outside world, its kind of, its Silk Road past, its treaty port um, past. And then there's red, which stands for revolutionary red of um, the events that brought the Communist Party to power. And in the opening ceremony, going from top left um, all around, you began with a series of yellow images that were literally yellow in the, uh, Zhang Yimou is nothing if not somebody who knows how to use color, amazingly. It began with a quote by Confucius, um, people dressed in yellow who were supposed to represent Confucius's um, disciples, the drummers who were in yellow. Then one of the next images up on the right, it was an image of the Zheng He, um, navigational exploration, which was a sign of China's links to the outside world, suffused with the color blue. And the people were dressed in blue um, there. But then finally, you ended on a red theme with all of the red flags and um, all of the reminders that, that China, please remember that we have this distant, glorious past. Also remember that there are times when we've opened to the world and we're opening it to again. But then ultimately, for both the national and the international audience, but don't forget who's still in power. What got attention and what didn't? OK. Um, 
I was fascinated by one of the things that didn't get attention that I think should have, which was Confucius's role in the opening ceremonies. I think in this case, the Roga said that the Olympics gave the world a chance to learn about China. And this was a great opportunity of learning that was just completely botched. There was a forgetting of the fact that over a long period of Chinese uh, recent past, Confucius had been denigrated, despised, struggled against. There he was showing up being celebrated in these Olympic uh, opening ceremonies. And all people said was, oh, China, the news commentary said, oh, China has its 5,000 years of tradition that it long has celebrated. So this was a missed thing. Confucius was the great comeback kid of the Olympic Games, the person who you could have counted as being out of contention. And there he was assuming the, the highest mantle of the medals, and nobody mentioned um, that fact. Final, I'll just end, and I can say more in the um, questions and answers about this yellow, blue, and red scheme, is that the games aren't over, that the, um, the, um, the, the relay goes on. The next stage is going to come complete with mascots. Um, at least as goofy as the Fuwa, I think more so. Hai Bao, which is the um, mascot of the 2010 um, World Expo. It's going to be high tech. It's going to be focusing on China as a country that's re-engaging with the world while still um, celebrating its, its glorious traditions of the past and still being a, a part of the communist presence. So be ready for this and be ready for all of the hype that won't play as much in the outside world as it does in China, because we, rather in America, we think of world's fairs as a has-been kind of thing, a 19th century thing, an early 20th century thing. But in much of the rest of the world, there's going to be a second chance of at least continuing the rebranding of China as a high-tech place and a place that's one of the big players in global spectacle. Thanks.